So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will mainly focus on the structural issues that we covered um, in the 2017 Economic Survey of China. Uh, we covered two broader structural areas. One is uh, the enterprise in the new normal, where uh, we think that uh, in the new normal where economic growth slows, enterprises have to find new ways uh, to cope with the slowing growth and the pressure on their uh, profits. And uh, we think that there are three major ways to cope with that. Uh, one is innovation entrepreneurship. The other is improving corporate governance practices and reforming state-owned enterprises. The other major topic that we cover is building a moderately prosperous society. There we cover the major elements of that uh, moderately prosperous society, which include the health system, the uh, social assistance, social security, and uh, to some extent also the education system. But uh, the education and skills were covered in the 2015 survey, so we didn't, don't cover those issues in depth here. So starting with the first major topic, um, the enterprise in the new normal, and uh, within that entrepreneurship. Boosting entrepreneurship uh, has been one of the major uh, measures that uh, Premier Li Keqiang uh, has been promoting um, since he came to power. And especially the simplification of administrative procedures and uh, licenses. We have an indicator system at the OECD, which is called the Product Market Regulatory Indicators, which are capable of capturing uh, this progress that has been made since 2013. This is a very large indicator system, including uh, several hundreds, nearly a thousand questions. And from this indicator system, uh, we use the so-called barriers to entrepreneurship subcomponent to measure uh, the progress on in, in this area. And we see that in, uh, compared to 2013, in 2016, the barriers to entrepreneurship have fallen substantially, no matter whether we look at uh, corporations or sole proprietary firms. Uh, with this, we refer to what uh, you call in Mandarin the Goethe, who, uh, the, for, with the sole proprietorships. Um, so th we, we can see a very um, sizable uh, progress in this area. So uh, barriers to entrepreneurship have fallen, so the entry has become much easier. But what about on the other side? What about the exit? Uh, we also looked at that, and we found that their uh, progress has been relatively limited. And also, there is uh, not much uh, in the pipeline, at least at this point. We looked at uh, bankruptcy legislation, and we figured out uh, several uh, aspects that need to be improved. First of all, uh, to file bankruptcy you need to reach an agreement with the staff. So the management needs to reach agreement with the staff on compensation. What we recommend here is instead of negotiating uh, compensation, workers could, should be compensated according to laws. Uh, the Chinese laws and regulations specify very clearly uh, how much people are entitled to after how many years. And so all the severance uh, payments are very clearly uh, put down in laws. So we recommend that uh, to reduce uncertainty and to accelerate the bankruptcy process, companies should uh, adhere to, to the laws and um, legislations instead of uh, going into negotiations on compensation. And um, no wonder why the share of bankruptcies has been uh, very low as a, as a share of um, firms exiting through bankruptcy uh, is even less than uh, 1%, 0.23%, as we see in this chart. Coming to innovation, which is the other major area the present government focuses on, looking at first on the input side, uh, spending on research and development is very often uh, seen as the input into innovation. And when comparing China with other countries, in uh, recent years, China's spending on R&D has reached 2% of GDP, which is much higher than in other middle-income countries, such as, uh, for instance, South Africa or Brazil, but is still lower than in many of the biggest innovators, such as Japan, the US, or Korea. Although it's uh, 
about the same as the OECD average or the average of the U15 countries. Most of the spending, however, is concentrated in a very few number of sectors. In particular, as you see in this chart, railway and other transport equipment, computer and other electronic equipment together uh, take up about more than 40% of all public funds for innovation. While at the other end, uh, there is not much support for a large number of industries. So it's basically those industries that are in the catalog which can benefit from government support. So we recommend to spread government support for innovation across more sectors. So we have seen um, on the input side a very fast rise. So spending on R&D is rising very fast. In 2015, China became number one in the world um, in, the, uh, in terms of uh, patents, which is uh, one of the output measures. So we can see both inputs and outputs are increasing. And now China owns about a third of uh, registered patents, and it has also overtaken even the US. So we can see a fast increase on both the input and the output side, but the link between the two is becoming weaker. So the elasticity of patenting with respect to R&D spending is small, and the impact of new patents on productivity has declined. So we try to figure out what could be behind this. So there are more and more uh, spending on innovation, there are more and more patents, but their impact on overall productivity is becoming weaker. We thought that there may be two major reasons behind this. One is quality and the other is relevance. Starting with quality, there are several measures uh, to uh, indicate the quality of patents. But for what, uh, what is available for China, uh, we had to limit ourselves to a couple. Uh, we used uh, the share of invention patents. In China, there are three types of patents. In addition to invention patents, there are also utility patents and uh, exterior design patents. In many countries, the latter two are not considered as patents. In many countries, patents are only invention patents. But in China, the share of invention patents is uh, relatively low. So this increase to a large extent may be also coming from the increase in utility and exterior design patterns, which are only incremental improvements on existing products. Another way to measure patent quality is looking at the share of triadic patents. Those are the patents that are registered in the US, in the EU or, EU or Japan. So the share is relatively low, although in absolute terms, according to the most recent data that were released about a week ago, China is now number one in the world in terms of triadic patents, and it registered about 18% of all patents in 2016. So you may remember in the previous slide, we saw that China has about a third of world patents, but only about 18% of triadic patents. The other issue with patents may be relevance, which is, although the number of patents is increasing very fast, but many of those patents are not put into use or not commercialized at all. So the utilization is particularly low for those patents that were uh, registered by universities or research institutions. In the previous uh, economic survey to 2015, uh, where uh, we covered education and skills more in depth. We dealt with this issue and we looked at what percentage of uh, patents registered by universities and research institutions is uh, utilized and uh, we found out it's, it's only 5%. Comparable data in other countries, especially OECD countries, would be much higher. In Japan, for instance, it's 27%. Uh, Behind that, uh, there may be uh, the incentives that are driving patent registrations in China. And those incentives uh, relate to the performance evaluation system. For researchers, either in academia or research institutions, 
um, it's mainly the number of patents that uh, they register that counts either for their promotion or for their contract or in general for their performance evaluation. But th there is uh, no um, taking on, into account whether those um, patents are finally uh, utilized or commercialized. But uh, we can say in general that patents cannot fully capture innovation output. This is due to different reasons. I mean, uh, R&D spending is not only to register patents. Of course, there are many other outputs uh, that we could look at, for instance, trademarks or uh, new products, which we will look in the next slide. And patents are also cannot fully capture innovation output because even those firms that could otherwise uh, register patents, they don't apply. They just decide not to apply for patents. And uh, two thirds of those uh, firms, they uh, do not apply for patents because they think uh, that patent right cannot effectively protect their inventions. And many of uh, patent holders uh, experienced violation of their patent rights, about 18%. And many of those uh, do not take any measure once they experience violation. And particularly, uh, domestic firms and smaller firms tend not to uh, take any measure. So what do these firms do that decide not to uh, register uh, or not to apply for patents? They um, adopt several strategies. Uh, for instance, they reap first mover advantage by quickly marketing their invention, or they sign confidentiality agreement with their staff, or they change products so quickly so that competitors cannot catch up. Uh, this illustrates uh, another potential measure of uh, output of innovation, which is new products, which make up a relatively large part of revenue in some high-tech industries. Here we can see that computer manufacturing, it, uh, they make up more than a third of all products. Here we use the Chinese definition for a new products, which can be either um, approved by the um, Ministry of uh, Science and Technology, or uh, they can be uh, self-declared by the company. But if it's self-declared, it's only valid for one year. So China to continue its way uh, towards a major innovator adopted several strategies. One is the main in China 2025, which is uh, focusing on new and high-tech industries. And the other one is Internet Plus, uh, which is promoting the use of Internet, not only in commercial areas, but also beyond that in the public um, service as well. Uh, we, however, highlight in the report that um, for internet to play an even greater role in uh, every part of not just the economy, but of the whole society, uh, costs need to be reduced and the speed need to increase. The other way that we consider firms should um, look at when uh, considering improving performance is corporate governance. When we talk about corporate governance, um, very often we limit ourselves to listed firms because that's what corporate governance principles uh, include. The corporate governance principles in China are based on the OECD best practices. And now uh, they are being changed as uh, there have been several uh, developments since uh, those practices were adopted some years ago. We highlighted some areas where corporate governance needs to uh, be improved, and one area is uh, independent directors. So most of the firms, most of the listed firms, here we only talk about listed firms because these corporate governance uh, principles only apply for listed firms. So most of uh, listed firms, uh, they have the exact number of independent directors that is required by law. So most firms, they don't see the value of having an additional independent director. So it's uh, less than 9% of firms, of all listed firms, which are now uh, about 3,000, a little bit over 3,000. So only about 9% have more than the legally required number of independent directors. And the reason is that uh, independent directors are not really independent. So one of our recommendations is to 
strengthen their independence and, and their decision-making role. So, so the decision-making role of the board could be strengthened by that. So if the directors are truly independent. Another issue is uh, ownership concentration, which although has declined over the past decade or decade and a half, but it's still relatively high. For instance, um, the biggest shareholder holds more than a third of shares in uh, about 45% of, of listed companies in 2016, which is still very high. And the third area uh, we cover um, in this chapter, um, the way to improve corporate performance is to accelerate the reform of uh, state-owned enterprises. In a previous session, we already heard about enterprise debt and the size of uh, over enterprise debt, which reached about 175% of um, GDP. And um, in this chapter, we go more into the details and uh, we showed that this debt is mainly coming from state-owned enterprises. About 70-75% of all corporate debt is accumulated by SOEs. And to avoid a further accumulation of debt, uh, which is mainly SOE debt, we, we can say so, uh, we think that the most important uh, thing to do is to gradually remove implicit guarantees to state-owned enterprises and other public entities. Here, by other public entities, we mainly mean uh, local government investment vehicles, which also accumulated large amounts of public debt, which had to finally be assumed by the government in the last couple of years. Looking at the details, so where is this SOE debt originating from, and where is, uh, where, which, which are the sectors or which are the types of uh, state-owned enterprises where leverage is high, we found that it is mainly real estate enterprises where corporate leverage is uh, even higher than in other SOEs. And um, when looking at the types of SOEs, here we distinguish three types. The central SOEs, what we call here central, those are the SOEs that are controlled by the central SASAC. And the local, what we call local here, are, are the local SOEs that are controlled by the local SASACs. And what we call agency are those are the state-owned enterprises that belong to ministries and other government agencies, which belong to neither of the previous two categories. So we see that uh, this last category, the SOEs that are controlled by government ministries and agencies, uh, so a very sharp increase in their leverage, and their leverage keeps to be the highest, uh, stays to be the highest among all uh, SOEs. <clears throat> so summing up the recommendations for this chapter, uh, we think that government support for innovation should be spread across more sectors. But what is even more important in the area of innovation is strengthening intellectual property rights, by, uh, intellectual property right protection by more systematically prosecuting violators and raising fines. In the area of entrepreneurship, uh, the bankruptcy process um, should be accelerated and uncertainty reduced. And as mentioned before, uh, those people who are laid off, they should be compensated according, in according to uh, relevant laws. In the area of corporate governance in general, going beyond the corporate governance of just listed firms, we think that um, regular publication of company accounts uh, should be required. And uh, disclosure standards for all firms should be increased. Uh, at the moment, it's only listed firms that are obliged to disclose their accounts to the public. And also, uh, penalties for individuals committing fraud should be increased, <clears throat> because this is becoming a, a very common issue. On the SOE front, um, the major recommendation is to gradually remove implicit guarantees to state-owned enterprises and other public entities. Also, state-owned enterprises should have professional management, and uh, business and politics should be separated. So the practice where um, civil servants assume uh, top positions in state-owned enterprises should be stopped. 
Also, the independence and the decision-making role of the board uh, should be strengthened by truly independent directors. Coming to the next issue, which is building a moderately prosperous society. We have seen that in the past decades, poverty rate has declined dramatically. But when looking at the distribution of income, uh, the inequalities are still relatively high. All the inequalities measured by the Gini coefficient have come down significantly over the past decade or so, but the level is still very high compared to other countries, especially compared to OECD countries. Moreover, in rural areas, the poor are falling further behind. Here we can see it in the green bars that income inequality in rural areas has in fact increased over the past decade or so. And even in urban areas, inequalities um, have been falling only very uh, gradually, only to a very limited extent. So in such circumstances where income inequalities are so large, there should be an effective tax and transfer system that does the redistribution. However, uh, from this chart we can see that the impact of the tax and transfer system on inequalities is, is nearly zero. It's very limited in China compared to other countries. So in this respect, we recommend to broaden the personal income tax base to include not just salary income, but all other types of income, including like, for instance, rental income, but also um, capital gains, and to increase tax progressivity. A lot of uh, lower level governments have no sufficient funds uh, to channel for social assistance purposes. And that is mainly related to the imbalance between their revenues and expenditures. Here we only show the own revenues. So at, especially at the lowest levels, at the county level, uh, these imbalances are uh, very significant. So we recommend to increase central and provincial government social assistance transfers to poor areas. The family background has a very large impact on student performance. Here you can see the PISA scores. Um, probably you are familiar what the PISA scores are. They measure performance of uh, 12, 13 year old students in the areas of science, reading, and mathematics. This is a worldwide use test, which is administered by the Education Directorate of the OECD. And uh, Shanghai has been participating uh, since a few years ago. And here we can see that one of the sub-indicators, this is also a whole indicator system, which is uh, about economic, social, and cultural status of students. The impact of these indicators on uh, student performance is much higher in China than in OECD countries. That is to say that the family background is much more important, has a very large impact on student performance in China, in particular in the area of reading. But even in science and mathematics, the impact is much higher than in OECD countries. So we uh, recommend to increase public funding for child care and introduce incentives to encourage the participation of migrant children and those in rural areas in early childhood education. In OECD, we pay particular attention to early childhood education, and especially that in China, in rural areas, it's very often not available. Uh, we discussed this issue more in detail in the 2015 economic survey. Coming to the area of health, which is another major ingredient of uh, relatively prosperous, moderately prosperous society. Uh, the major issue we found in this area is the uneven distribution of resources. So in rural areas, you hardly find any good quality uh, resources, either hospitals or either doctors. But in rural areas, they mainly concentrate in the biggest cities and in the best hospitals. The, the best equipment or the best um, doctors only concentrate in um, the best hospitals. And uh, to get into those hospitals, you need uh, 
registration ticket and you have to queue for that. And what we have seen in recent years, uh, there have been some very clever people who made use of this uh, situation and uh, they started selling these uh, registration um, tickets, the so-called ticket scalpers. And we think that uh, what these ticket scalpers earn, that money should rather be earned by the doctors who otherwise have very low salaries. So the way we um, recommend is to uh, allow doctors to provide fee-based medical services in public hospitals by renting uh, the room where, where otherwise they work um, a few hours after their standard work time. So let's say uh, if a doctor works like uh, eight hours for the public hospital, then he or she could be allowed to work, let's say, an extra two or three hours in the same room by paying uh, rental fees to the hospital for the equipment and for the room. And during those two or three hours, um, he or she could receive private patients. So that money uh, could be earned by the doctor. So this way, uh, there would be no need for ticket scalpers because people would uh, uh, be able to get a, a fast treatment during these uh, fee paying hours and also doctors could uh, earn higher salaries and not to mention that they wouldn't need to find other sources of income the retirement age is uh, very low in china in particular for women here you see the triangles which show um, different retirement age for women than that for men and there are very few countries uh, that uh, have a different retirement age for women, and China is one of those countries. So we recommend to gradually increase and unify the pension age to 65, and then index it to life expectancy. I mean, indexing to life expectancy, that's the best practice that we also recommend to other countries, also OECD countries. So to some of the major recommendations in uh, the area of building a moderately prosperous society, okay. We recommend to base social security contributions on actual income earned. So in the present system, uh, there is a, a minimal uh, fixed contribution that people have to pay, uh, irrelevant of how much they earn. So this uh, poses a high uh, burden on low income earners. Then um, central and provincial government um, transfers should be increased to poorer areas so that those areas can spend more on social assistance. And to uh, re reduce inequalities, the personal income tax base should be broadened and uh, tax progressivity should be increased. Uh, inequalities uh, in income are high that we saw in the figures, but in wealth, um, they are even higher. Uh, that is why we recommend to implement a broad-based nationwide recurrent property tax and consider an inheritance tax that could potentially include some basic inheritance allowance. I've just mentioned that the pension age should be unified at 65 uh, for both women and men and indexed to life expectancy. And also uh, pension rights should be made portable, which is um, theoretically uh, has been implemented, but in practice, it's not very easy to draw pension rights in different locations from where uh, they were earned. Also in the area of uh, child care, as um, just mentioned, public funding should be increased and um, especially migrant children should be taken care of. And um, yeah, the last one is that they just um, discussed how to increase doctor's salaries by allowing them to provide fee-based medical services. Thank you.